Okay. I, I was asked to give a keynote speech, which is really rather scary. The only advantage is that nobody can ask questions at the end. So then raise a few questions then, and then we'll see whether I get in emails threatening me. I have two aims today. One is to introduce a really wonderful source on UN social and religious history, even on economic history. But I will not talk about the economic part. And I want to make an argument uh, about the use of the term Buddhism, which I think is really very problematic. Maybe not if you talk about high flung doctrine, but if you talk about local or generally religious culture in any part of the Chinese past, the term Buddhism does not really help. And I want to make a very specific historical argument, which may be wrong, but I will make it so that we can discuss it later on, whether the late Ming is just another instantiation of the same interaction as I will be describing for the Yuan dynasty. So do we have a Ming revival of Buddhism in the late Ming, or is it something different from the Sung and the Yuan periods? And whenever I use these terms, Buddhism, Confucianism, well, I won't use the term Confucianism today, but Buddhism and Taoism, please keep in mind, these are very late Western constructs. That is our Western terms, they're Western constructs, and so whenever we use them to talk about the Chinese past, it means whatever we want it to mean. It has no intrinsic predetermined meaning within the Chinese sources. It's just what we think it is. So it's pretty fake. Uh, the source I will be using is a inscription, which is extant from a temple, which if you use Google Maps, uh, you can no longer see. It's in Changxing. Changxing is on the northeast south, on the western side of Lake Tai, Taihu, in Zhejiang province. It's not a particularly famous place, but the inscription is actually particularly famous among social historians. Sadly, the temple is gone. This is the object, heavily damaged, as you can see. Uh, on the right hand side, we have the front of the inscription, but on the left, very recently, I was lucky that a student of mine got in touch with the director of the museum where the inscription now is, and they made a very detailed photograph of the back. And that allows me to make some corrections of, sorry, of the 19th century transcript that we have of this text. So historians until now have been using the transcript, but at least I was lucky enough to get a really good picture which is still hard to read, off the back. Um, most people in China or outside China are only interested in this bit, as I will explain. This is a rubbing from the modern stone, but I think there's also rubbings circulating from an earlier period. The damage is mostly in the left hand, left bottom corner. Um, this is what the, sorry for the typo, this is the layout of the backside. Uh, it's a small part because if I gave you the entire, as you have seen, here, you can't really read it, certainly not if you're watching this on your laptop. And I think even on a laptop, on a laptop, even this enlarged version is still very hard to read. But what is important is that the whoever did the, the calligraphy, whoever did the cutting, they really cared. They took a lot of trouble to uh, provide two headings. One heading is uh, shown here. It's the heading to the section on the donations. There is another heading which is the section on land donations, which I have not included here and I won't discuss it. At least I discuss it in the paper, but it's still very much taikao. Uh, this is the heading to the donations of unknown amounts of money or grain or something, at least to the main, to the restoration of this temple in 1313, 1314. It's very rare. It's not rare to have a list of donations on the back of an inscription, but it's really rare that it is done with this kind of headings in seal script. It means it was really important. Um, why is the object, the inscription still preserved? Because it was calligraphed by one of, by the, at the time, the most famous calligrapher of China, Zhao Mengfu, and still one of the most famous. He may not be Wang Xichir, but he ranks roughly in that direction. So what are we talking about? We're talking about a temple that's lost, it's gone, as you have already seen on the satellite picture. Uh, but it was once upon a time a major cult in traditional China. And in fact, we will see some pictures later that even today, a number of temples of this cult 
are still extant and they're never small. It's devoted to the emperor of the Eastern March Mount, Tungyue Tati, who can be called, at least in Yuan Dynasty, Tianqi Ta Sheng Ren Sheng Ti. It's a big mouthful, and I'm not going to translate it. It just becomes horrible English. Uh, there's a very high title. There are not many deities in the Yuan period which are called emperor. Yeah, it symbolically puts him on the same level as the real emperor, the human emperor. Yeah, so he deserves a koto, a ninefold koto. Yeah, and if you climb Mount Tai today, you might still see old ladies doing a ninefold koto. Yeah, whilst they are ascending the mountain. Um, it's also an underworld bureaucracy connected, to, as I said, to Mount Tai. Nowadays, it's perhaps somewhat replaced by the pilgrimage, the cult of uh, Tai Shan Yang Yang, yeah, uh, the Lady of Mount Tai, which has just been uh, there has just been published a wonderful book by Sun Nakan or Nakan, yeah, on this particular deity, which I can recommend everybody maybe not to buy. It's expensive, but at least to read it. It's a beautiful and very interesting book. So underworld bureaucracy, also exorcist bureaucracy, people who do Taoist ritual studies will encounter this figure all the time. Yeah, because lower deities in this bureaucracy are summoned in order to fight demons, demons of illness, demons of all kinds of background. Uh, so in traditional China, every county and in the lower Yangtze region, every Jun township would have a temple devoted to this particular deity. It's never a small temple. It cannot be a small temple because it's not just this deity. He has this entire bureaucracy, which also requires temple halls, side halls, or shrines. So it's never a small temple. And he or his deities, like the Su Bao Si, the Office of Speedy Retribution, they get lots of inscriptions, anecdotes, and even theater plays. And there are not many deities yet that have their own theater plays already in the Yuan Dynasty. And if you're interested, you can read an article in clear by Wilt Ilma on the topic. So this is it again. And here I've put the labels in. Uh, and please, again, quotation marks around the labels. There are modern classifications. This is not what it was called at the time. Underworld beliefs, of course, very important in this cult. He is the one of the deities of the underworld. Um, largely Buddhist inspired. We never call it Buddhist anymore because we reserve the term Buddhism from a modern perspective for doctrine. But historically speaking, uh, without Buddhism, we wouldn't have had this kind of stuff. Um, Buddhist ritual specialists yeah, are the main specialists engaged in funerary ritual, funerary provisions. And in this particular inscription, yeah, uh, this returns because there is lay Buddhist society, Fu Tianzi, who donate money to the maintenance of this temple. There's the exorcist bureaucracy, as I've mentioned already, and there's the state cult. The state cult is mentioned in front, on the front side of the inscription. Uh, that's the main reason why officials and why someone like Dauman Fu feel that they are entitled, yeah, that they are allowed to support this cult. Um, this was not a cult hidden in the back alleys of Changxing. Uh, any temple devoted to the Eastern March Mount was, as, I, as you can see on the right, it's my hypothetical reconstruction of the case of Changxing. It's a really big temple complex, yeah, but it would always be big. It would have landed property. It would usually be connected to the Longhu Shan uh, Tian Shi Dao, so the heavenly master tradition of Longhu Shan. It would be supported by local bureaucrats because the date is an avatar of Mount Tai, which goes back basically to the Tang, no, sorry, to the Shang dynasty, and I'm sure before that as well. So everybody would always know about this temple and probably visit it at one point in their lives when they visited the county capital or the prefectural capital. An inscription, any inscription, but certainly an inscription of this size in the courtyard of the traveling palace of the Eastern March Mount would be a highly visible object not like in the past here yeah behind glass or plexiglass i don't know yeah a very damaged and dirty in a museum with the maybe most important part yeah hidden from view because the most important part is of course the donations which show yeah that you have contributed to this important temple um but in the past 
then you could walk around it. And the example on the right is from its sister temple, which you can still visit, and I recommend it in Beijing. Yeah, uh, the Tung Yam Yam. It would be on a turtle pedestal or another kind of uh, monstrous creature. It would have a covering stone. It would be very high in size. And this particular inscription without the turtle and without the stone, without this covering stone is still two meters high. So this is not your small inscription that you can overlook. It carries the handwriting of already during his lifetime, the most famous Yuan dynasty calligrapher, Zhao Menfu, who, by the way, was a lay Buddhist, and so was his wife. So having this kind of inscription in the temple was a major advertisement. It's like a preface yeah, by, a, by the local party secretary. Uh, it's like when I was in Oxford, we had the calligraphy of uh, Wen Jiabao. And every Chinese visitor, mainland Chinese visitor, would say, wow, you have calligraphy of Wen Jiabao. Right? That's the kind of important significance that's assigned to the mere calligraphy of the text. Now, the original message, and that's important, the original message of the inscription, both the front and the back side, was there for everybody to see. And it was the message that all kinds of people cooperated to do this huge project. This was not cheap. We don't know the price, but this was not cheap. Yet all local officials, that is, officials appointed from the center, were part of this group. Uh, all assistants, let's say the local bureaucracy, the Yaman was part of the group, soldiers were part of the group, and so on and so forth. Buddhist groups, Taoist groups, if you call state officials, Confucians or classicists, they would call themselves Ru. They were also part of the group. Now, the support of the bureaucracy is very visible in the inscription on the front side and the back side, of course. Uh, but also interestingly, because of the many offices, we also have a list of all kinds of lower level bureaucratic instances contributing. And you can see it here in the list. I'm not going to read it aloud. Yeah, so the local police, the local clerks, uh, the local legal assistants, the local prison guards, really everybody yeah, who was somewhat involved in the local bureaucracy contributed to the temple and made themselves visible in the inscription. So the bureaucracy went all out to support this temple. There's a lot of, and that's especially important, Buddhist support. It's the reason I took this particular example. That there is a monk, Zhengming, of the former, it's explicit, Qian, Bai Yunzong, the former white cloud tradition, which had been prohibited officially 20 years before, roughly 20 years before. Um, they received instruction of the monk Xiang, of the, a former manager of the shirt teachings. Yes, it means Buddhism, but that means Buddhism as a state bureaucracy, not Buddhism like we use the term today. And they were invited in to take care of the restoration. And Mr. Zhengming and Mr. Wu Xiang do not come from Changxing. They come from Jiaxing and Hangzhou. Yes, so someone sent a letter or a messenger yeah, to these people to come and help them do this huge project. And there's other religious groups, yeah? uh, in this case, Buddhist religious groups that are involved. What does that mean? This kind of project, it usually means rebuilding the temple completely. This is a modern example. So they have lots of safety precautions. I'm sure that at the time there were no safety precautions, but it's a big deal, this kind of temple project. And it's not just any Buddhist support. The white cloud tradition, you already noticed it, I hope, they were prohib prohibited. Uh, they were actually prohibited several times, and they were not prohibited for religious reasons. They were prohibited because uh, local landowners, probably bigger landowners, were using the tradition to get uh, uh, to avoid land taxes. So it was a political problem. Yeah, because no land taxes means no income for the state, and that means you cannot pay your officials. So it's a kind of anti-corruption measure, but has nothing to do with religious heterodoxy, although that is sort of how they end up in the secondary scholarship today. Um, they are widespread of the lower Yangtze region. They are not marginal at all. They're extremely visible. They even published a complete Buddhist canon, which is still excellent today. The copy I have seen is in Tokyo, but it is also extant in China, in mainland China. And it has been reprinted in the early 20th century. And this Buddhist canon project was supported by all kinds of people. Uh, nobody was hiding 
yeah, from supporting this particular tradition. But still, they are explicitly identified in this very visible inscription as former. So as what we would say illegal. Apparently, it didn't matter, right? Not on a local level. And they did this, this whole project at the instructions of a monk official, or at least someone who used to be a monk official in the Shridya. As I said, it's not Buddhism in the modern sense. It is the evidence that the state supervisory structure for, Buddh for Buddhist monasteries, not Buddhism, for Buddhist monasteries was involved. And the whole purpose of mentioning these structures was yeah, not to claim it as a Buddhist project, but to say everything in this project is legitimate, it's legal. It's fine to contribute. There's Taoist support. Um, normally speaking, that's one of the surprises of studying this inscription. Normally speaking, this cult is more closely identified with Taoist ritual specialists, especially heavenly masters. Uh, the one in Peking until the early 1950s had a temple keeper who was from the uh, Tian Shui Tao. And in southern China, we have similar examples. So it, if anything, it was, uh, was managed yeah, by priests from, by ritual specialists from the Tian Shui Tao. The one I visited in Trencho, uh, when, I did, when I went there in 1992, it was still unrestored. It was largely still destroyed. Nowadays, it has been restored. It was also connected with Tian Shui priests. And um, only one Taoist institution supports this particular case, but it is the most important Taoist institution of Changxing in the early 14th century, the Chungjunguan. They also have a local version of the Guanyu cult in its Taoist manifestation. I don't know how they translated into local practice, but the name of the cult in this particular instance is the Southern Chinese Taoist exorcist version of Guanyu, not the Northern Chinese version, who is more closely linked with military groups. Now, Taoist traditions were also very capable of doing this kind of project. So it's not a, probably not a religious decision. It's just that locally, the white cloud tradition was strong. Probably Taoist traditions were less strong. Uh, Wang Jinping, she write, I think she right, has written a wonderful book where it's the Taoist traditions which are involved in yeah, uh, Mongol period restoration and building projects. There's religious and commercial support. This is the reason the temple inscription is so famous. Whilst I talked, you can read. Um, many guilds, there's a total of 20 guilds, that is 20 organizations who self-identify with the suffix or term Hang, not Xing, Hang, yeah? and, but also others, doctors, midwives, carpenters, and so forth, yeah? who all support this particular temple showing that this is not just a bureaucracy, it's not just Buddhists in the sense of Buddhist monasteries, not just a Taoist monastery, but also local guilds. And the examples I give here, they are guilds who uh, provide stuff for religious ritual. That's why I call them religious commercial. But there's other guilds who, normally speaking, they might worship a, a Zusher, an ancestral teacher of their profession, but we don't know because that's not mentioned, but they don't have a religious background. That is, they don't sell stuff for religious occasions. There's uh, barbers, for instance, among them. So what is the significance of this temple at the local level? This and what is demonstrated by these contributors, the, the range of these contributors. It receives the highest possible local bureaucratic support. In the paper, I mentioned their ranks, um, but we are talking about people who have, there is no provinces yet, or there is something like the provinces of the Ming dynasty, but these people that write inscriptions have the level 2A, Arpin, Shang. Yeah, so that's pretty high up. And the prefectural official, uh, because Changxing at that point is a, a Zhou, it's still kind of a prefecture. Also, I think they are 2B or 3, they are quite high up. Yeah, these are not lowly officials, and all the local centrally appointed officials take part. All the social groups, professional groups, even religious groups of the region take part. Lots of individuals whom we don't know take part. The most famous calligrapher of the region, he's from the county next door, from Huzhou, or the prefecture next door, Huzhou. He takes part. There is nothing popular in the sense of Mintian, right? Uh, 
all social groups take part very wealthy people take part that becomes clear from the land donations and there's therefore nef nothing marginal this is as i will say later on it's the the low it's the equivalent of the cathedral of medieval europe uh, it's extremely mean, mainstream and if you are looking this is an old discussion does china have the kind of central religious institutions in society that you find in let's say on every marketplace in the bigger towns it goes back to a book edited by william skinner the city in imperial china and discussions around it this is the cathedral of traditional china at least in the Song and yuan period it changes a little bit in the ming and in the qing but in the Song yuan period this is the equivalent these are big places yeah these are some other examples of what i have just called as a challenge cathedrals one room Beijing, Tian, uh, and Tung, uh, Xing, Tung Yuan, uh, and there's more. Yeah, uh, you can just search for Tung Yuan Miao. Don't search for Tung Yuan Xing Gong. Nowadays, since the Ming, they're called Tung Yuan Miao. Yeah, and you will find quite a few, several dozens of surviving examples. And as I, as you can see, they are never small. They are not as big as some monasteries, but they are not small. And as I have just said, they are supported by society as a whole. Yeah, they are not leaving any group out, at least not in the Sumerian period. Now, I have used the modern labels, Buddhism and Taoism, but I already warned you, put quotation marks around it. Because I don't think it helps very much to use these labels to understand the religious phenomena at hand. Neither does the label popular explain anything, unless you mean Yoxing, widely, widely worshipped, right? widespread. But then... It also means nothing because if it's widespread, then everybody worships it. And yeah, the term popular means very little. Uh, I think using these labels simply leads to non questions. Why does a Buddhist institution such as the white cloud tradition by Yuzong support what is usually seen in the literature as a Taoist or a state institution? Yeah, is this syncretism? Well, it's only syncretism when you use the labels, but in the minds of the people at the time, these labels did not represent realities, not social realities anyhow, right? Is this Buddhist? No, of course it's not Buddhist. I'll get back to that. Yeah, because it's not Buddhist doctrine. So why should Buddhologists, but then I'm not a Buddhologist, why should they care? So what happens is that the people who do religious studies usually ignore this case. Yeah, this kind of temple. Certainly, Buddhologists ignore it because it's not Buddhist doctrine. It does not fit our conceptions. And so, what happens is people, social economic, social historians like Kato Shigeshi and many after him, they have looked at the list of guilds because it's one of the earliest testimonies on guilds, Han, or the few historians who have looked at the Pai Yun Zung, they look at the little bit that's on the Pai Yun Zung but in a very limited way, in fact. And nobody looks at the larger thing, the larger whole, the integrative force that the traveling palace of the Eastern March Mount really was. So from the perspective of traditional labels, because it doesn't fit, yeah, we don't need to study this inscription. On the other hand, if we do not include it in a discussion of whatever Buddhism is, and I don't know really, it distorts our understanding of Buddhism because it would suggest that Buddhism is only about Buddhist monasteries and not about other things like this particular case. So is there an upaya, is there a fangbian or hobin out of the conceptual mess? Well, simplest for me is to talk about Buddhism and Taoism not as absolute presences, but as sources of inspiration or cultural resources so different people would access these in different ways. Yeah? But there is not an absolute separate yeah, Buddhist or Taoist or popular religion thing. People move around these resources and access them in different ways. And they these ways are individual. And I think we just heard some of that in the previous panel as well. Labels can help us talk about the cultural influence, hence the pun, the fang bian part. But very often it's not very fang bian. It's not very convenient, the modern meaning of the term. So what does this mean for our case study? Well, actually, but nobody talks about it this way, this cult, this underworld cult is extremely Buddhist. It could not ever have come into being without 
Buddhism as a religious culture, not as doctrine, but as religious culture, because there would not have been the underworld. And it's the Buddhist funerary specialist, most of all, who keep the idea of the underworld where you are punished or rewarded, where you are processed after you die, alive. Yeah, without Buddhist monks and priests performing these rituals, yeah, there would be much less of a underworld culture in traditional China, or even today for that matter. Right? But this part of the cult is never called Buddhist because it doesn't fit the way we use the label. At the time, the white cloud tradition by Yun Zhong was classified as Shi Jiao, or the teachings of Shakyamuni, and it co cooperated with individuals or groups we could call or should call as Buddhist inspired. But this is a label of state control. And in fact, I would submit that the way we use the term Buddhism or Taoism is partner term or Confucianism. The way we use it today is more like an instrument of state control, top down, and not of what people are actually doing, because people are not doing either Buddhist or Taoist or even aware of these labels. They can't be aware of these labels since traditional China does not have neat equivalents for them. The notion of lay Buddhism, you could call some of the people involved in this cult lay Buddhists, but then from when onwards are people lay Buddhists? I always ask people this question, monks, and they're very hard put. Basically, they think of lay Buddhists as the people who follow uh, monastic leadership. But there's lots of people outside the monasteries who we could also talk about. So I'm going to run out of time. Um, one usage in which it might be useful is the following. This inscription, and there's much more evidence like it, shows that in the Sung and Yuan period, especially Southern Sung and Yuan period, Buddhist inspired institutions, individuals are extremely engaged in social action. Here, they provide leadership in restoring a temple, but they also build bridges, roads, free hot water, they hand out medicine, do rituals for the unknown dead, and so on. It was especially strong about among the white cloud teachings and the white lotus movement, not by Lin Tiao, of course. In fact, they essentially continue the kind of Buddhist engagement in local society that Jacques Charnet and others, of course, have described. They are prohibited. And now something changes, I would claim. And that is that, yes, we have a sort of seeming revival of Buddhism as a intellectual thing in the late Ming, and it tries to make an impact on society, but it does not regain the prominence that you see for Buddhist inspired institutions or Taoist inspired institutions of the Sui Yuan period. So yes, there is a revival, but it's a different thing. I would think that this inscription and the materials studied by Wang Jinping in her book are sort of a last hurrah of monastic Buddhism as leaders in local society beyond providing rituals and beyond Buddhist beliefs. And that innovation from the late Ming onwards comes from other traditions that we need to study. And that on a local level, instead of Buddhist monasteries and Taoist temples, it's local religious institutions led by local lay people who yeah, organized society from the late Ming onwards. So in that respect, what we need is more work, a lot more work of local religious life without using these labels. So yes, thank you. Wonderful book. I have reviewed it and I liked it at the time and I still like it today. But we should drop these labels. So people who only study Buddhism should start looking at other stuff to understand how Buddhism fits in. How would they think how what they think is Buddhism fits in the larger whole, instead of restricting themselves to Buddhist priests or Buddhist canons or Buddhist sutras, because that's not the way in which these things worked on a local level. And as we all know, these labels, late in origin, are the products of the Western enlightenment. They reflect categories of control. Essentially, what we call Buddhism today is what the state in traditional China and today calls Buddhism. And what the state does not admit as Buddhism is not admitted as Buddhism in the usual research. Um, and it ignores a lot of innovation that also took place from the late Ming onwards. Uh, local religious institutions, which double as social institutions, uh, they are ignored still too much. Lineage is now being studied. Uh, and new religious groups that come up again 
they appear in the Sumerian UN period, but they come up again in the late May period. They have been persecuted, so they're hard to study, but they're super important. And then in the 19th century, we get another new religious movement of Wuji, yeah, or Luan Tang of, uh, now I've forgotten how you call it in Chinese, in English, a spirit writing. Okay, so that's it. Um, Baron, that was an absolutely brilliant presentation. Um, I think, if, if I may say, I think you and I are coming at the same problem from, from uh, slightly different perspectives. I, I, I agree that the, um, the complexity of religious activity, and we can just set the doctrine aside. What are people doing as part of the way in which they seek to orient themselves in the world? What are they building? What, what meetings are they holding? What rituals are they carrying out? Um, there is this great... Uh, um, confluence of these influences. And I, I, I particularly liked your provocation of suggesting that the, Mar, uh, the Eastern Marchmount uh, Temple is something like a cathedral in a European city. Um, and I think it's a comparison that works very well because the cathedral, of course, wasn't the place where everybody would wander in. It was a kind of zone set up by the urban elite, but it was the... the um, the, the uh, point of focus of, of religious life in the city. And um, it reminds us also that we're speaking here very much of an urban phenomenon. Quite what goes on in the villages may be different, but um, I agree with you. And I think if we could, uh, if we could this kind of more sympathetic, uh, synthetic analysis that you're, you're engaged in, uh, I think it's tremendous. So thank you very much for um, producing Thank you. It's brilliant keynote. So if, if someone wants to have the PowerPoint, the PowerPoint obviously is, is more polemic. And certainly uh, I, I wrote the PowerPoint after I finished my draft of the paper. And as usual, after you finish writing a paper, you change your mind on things or you evolve. So people are interested, just send me a note by email. I'm very easy to find online. Uh, Byron Tahar Hamburg uh, will do the trick or just Byron Tahar might work as well. Um, and then I will gladly send you the paper as it stands and the PowerPoint, and then we can also correspond and hopefully pleasantly disagree in a dialectical way. So there are antagonistic and non-antagonistic uh, contradictions, uh, and let's hope that we can have non-antagonistic debate.